Um, welcome everyone to the second installment of our talk shop series featuring candid conversations with our most esteemed members. Thank you as always to our title sponsors, Principal, Retail One, and MDI Worldwide. Before we get started, we do have a couple of notes and announcements. This is going to take a few minutes for me to run through, so please have patience with me. <laughs> Tonight's event will start out as a discussion between Laura, Ian, and myself, but we will open the event up for the last 15 to 20 minutes as a full group discussion. At this time, you can have the option to unmute yourself, turn on your camera, and ask any questions you have live. If you have questions before then, feel free to type them into the chat and we'll answer them as we bring everybody on. The Institute as a whole is focused on supporting our members in any way possible. We're holding a town hall meeting May 6th at noon Eastern. It's a great opportunity to hear what we have planned and pass along any feedback you may have. Registration is open on the Retail Design Institute's website. If you are hiring or seeking a new opportunity, please make use of the job board on the, on the website as well. International has crafted a series on the job search itself. The first three installments can be found on the Retail Design Institute's YouTube page. The fourth installment, which is a virtual Ask Me Anything with a panel of experts, will take place on May 4th at 6 p.m. Eastern. Registration links can be found on the LinkedIn page or the Institute's website. The Atlanta Southeast chapter has started our own web series called Tips from the Trenches, focused on sharing professional skills and knowledge that may not have been offered in design school. The first episode can be found on our YouTube page. It's hosted by our own Daniel Wiggins and touches on five steps to building a sustainable freelance practice. International continues to host CEU courses monthly, so please check the LinkedIn page for the latest news and registration links. If you or your company are interested in participating, please reach out to us via email at atlantasoutheast at retaildesigninstitute.org. We're looking for a tech slash AV guru to join our board and help us transition to, the, to a hybrid in-person virtual event model if you want to become more involved and have the skill set to help us make this transition, please contact us via email. Finally, we would love to spotlight our members in our monthly newsletter. So please share any big news or store openings with us, again, via email at atlantasoutheast at retaildesigninstitute.org. Now on to the show. Tonight, we are joined by Ian Rattray and Laura Davis-Taylor. Full disclosure, I know Ian pretty well as I have spent the last eight years working with him and learning from him at Retail One. Ian's career spans the globe and includes work with many household names. Technosa, Vision Source, Transitions, Boot Barn, Exxon Mobil, Sears, H&R Block, VW, Audi, Ford, the list goes on and on. But tonight he will share the experiences and philosophies that have shaped his work and his career and if you know Ian at all, you know those stories are going to be pretty entertaining. Laura Davis-Taylor will be leading our discussion this evening. Laura is a Chief Strategy Officer at In Reality. She is an author, advocator, teacher, and provocateur. She brings together decades of consulting experience in brand planning, CX design, digital transformation, and in-store innovation for some of the world's most successful brands. She serves on many boards, including our own, and we feel pretty lucky to have her. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura. Thank you, Catherine. And I'll add on, I also had the pleasure of working with Ian for five years in some of those brands. So it's gonna be super fun to share some, some of the stories in the trenches, but Ian, you are really, truly one of the most talented and humble design leads I've ever worked with. And there's nothing more wonderful than people like you that can tell us about your experience or journey and share some golden insights so that those of us, whether we're coming into design, whether we're seasoned or even looking back like your own can reflect and learn. But it really starts with your amazing kind of history and your story. So will you kick that off for us and kind of give us some color to how you got started? Absolutely. And uh, <clears throat> first of all, I'll say for all those nice things you've said, 
I'll give you guys the money later, okay? <laughs> okay, the early days, I'm Scottish. And uh, literally at the very beginning, this was me uh, when I was a wee one in Dundee, Scotland, uh, which is where I'm from. I literally grew up in a place like this, uh, tenement housing, and I was a street urchin. I mean, that was our playground. We went out in the street and we, uh, we played. And uh, at the age of 14, I'd had a little bit of an attitude. I did have more hair then, and it was red, but I actually began to work in retail. I, I kind of lied a little bit about my age. It was supposed to be 16, and I got a job at a bakery, and uh, I was selling pies at the age of 14, uh, after school, obviously. Um, I actually got a, a, a Saturday job at Jackson & Taylor. This was kind of fashion retail way back in the mid 70s. So a lot of lime green suits and six inch peak lapels and stuff like that. Uh, and I was 16, so I was allowed to be a, sat a Saturday boy, you were called back then. That then led into me being this little empresario kind of thing in the background. I actually uh, set up discos and, and made money off them, made some cash. And I actually put a band together, Sutek. And of course, I played nothing. I'm not musical at all in that way. Um, and I kind of put it together, and I was the manager. And that's me looking very involved in managing the band, as you can tell. Uh, my dance skills were legendary. And I could shred an air guitar like you cannot believe. And I was also pretty good at mopping the floors with my very long red hair back then. Uh, the lady with a the foot there, that's actually my wife now of 40 years, just to let you all know. Uh, university days were very hard work. You know, that's all we did was work hard, as you can tell from this. And if we ever got a critique from a professor that we didn't like, we had a really good way of dealing with it. Just take care of it. And even though you may look at those pictures, we actually dressed this way every day when we were in architecture school, not just for graduation. I just wanted to make that clear. So after graduation, it was time to head down to London and do some fun work. And uh, that was me on the left looking like a very young architect professional with the bow tie and everything. And on the right was the weekend stuff of jumping on the ferries to France to buy tons of cheap booze. It was about a third the cost of the UK. I worked on a lot of kind of cool projects, mainstream architecture back then. I was an architect at that point, uh, very into pencil work. Um, as I was designing, this is just one example. Uh, Another example here, this was a $500 million project, um, you know, fun project done in the, in the Docklands. And then eventually after about four years there, moved back up to Scotland. I kind of had a, a vision in my mind that I was going to go elsewhere in the world and been lucky, made a bit of money in London, went back to Scotland to buy a property, do a bit of, bit of, bit of investment there. I worked on the, um, the British Golf Museum for the Royal Nation in St. Andrews, which was a really fun project. I uh, worked on uh, Middle of the District Council. I was actually described in the Scotsman newspaper as a loose-limbed deconstructivist, whatever that meant, but uh, definitely fun projects to do. Uh, and I also designed Edinburgh Castle. You guys may not know this, but I designed Edinburgh Castle. Well, well, okay, just the store at Edinburgh Castle, uh, the Portcullis store. And this was actually my first proper retail project. I was 28 at the time I was a kid. And uh, it was a fun project and a really interesting, unusual project. Then came the big move. It was, let's have an adventure. So my wife and I moved to the States and worked for uh, two or three firms. But the first project I did was Orlando City Hall, the interiors for this. So literally, I'm off the boat join a company called CRSS, they hand me this project. And I'm thinking only in America. I love America. I mean, a 400,000 square foot interior. I actually moved deliberately from architecture to interiors uh, to gain new skill sets, uh, to learn new things and do different things. My first retail project um, at CRSS, there was literally one of the um, marketing people were walking through and going, hey, does anybody like cars? Does anybody want to do a project for Volkswagen? And I put my hand up again, a whole new area of expertise to learn, uh, automotive retail. Um, and I'm glad I did. I mean, did a lot of projects for Audi, Volkswagen, in the States, Mexico, Germany, and really got me into the whole retail arena. And again, this is way back in 1990. This is a while back. Uh, so this was a project uh, for Volkswagen rolled out to several hundred locations. And the thing to point out here is that is a monitor. Um, we were doing digital media back then, and that was the size of monitors that we had to deal with. Uh, it was crazy. 
uh, project for Audi as well, really fun project. Same thing, just making a space for them rolled out to multiple locations. But we actually had an issue where we couldn't model this. We didn't know exactly what the shape was going to be. We had an idea in our mind. And there was this guy in this darkened room, literally with a locked door. And there was a computer thing called an SGI. And it was running software called Wavefront, which is now called Maya. And we could go and ask him to model it. And we had no idea what that meant. So we went in there and showed him some drawings, went back the next day, and he had built it inside the computer. It was quite amazing. And he could turn it, and he could make it bigger and play with it and change materials. And at that point, my, my life changed. I realized here's a whole new way of designing. We don't have to sit and draw by hand anymore. We can do something cool with this. And that's kind of how I got into it. That then led to me setting up a digital design studio for CRSS. And these are some of the very early images. This was actually a project for Audi Germany, a uh, story of the future for them. And this was 1990. These images were published all over the place at that time. Uh, kind of really unique stuff back then. And then since then, all kinds of projects all over the world, in Kuwait, in Turkey, uh, here in the States, obviously, I actually work in the Middle East as well, and places like that. And the point I want to make here is the first couple of things you saw there, that, that's me. That's my kind of aesthetic, you know, very modern, very clean, very crisp. But it's got to be appropriate for the client and the customer base, you know, and the experience that you're trying to create. So even though this isn't my bag, um, it's what was appropriate for that particular client. And, uh, you know, there's, you can still make it look good. It can still be gorgeous. Uh, just some fun stuff we've done with Boot Barn. Catherine's done a ton of work on this stuff as well, obviously. And, you know, help guide me, Catherine, thank you, mm -hmm. uh, as well. And, uh, you know, Vision Source. And there's all kinds of very large rollout programs that we've done over the years. And obviously, it's important to look classy when you go and get those design awards, you know. Even though we don't necessarily, it's not about the awards, it's nice to get them, hold the award, thank your mom, that kind of thing. And it's good to look classy, isn't it, Catherine? Always. Um, and then over the years, many fine fellows have been met. I did notice that Mark Michelson is on the uh, is on is on today. So hi, Mark. That's you on the right. Uh, that's us in the Rhine Valley. We were doing a big research pro research project for six weeks over in Europe. Uh, the three of us. Uh, so over a hundred retail clients worldwide worked on worked in fourteen different countries, and I'm actually physically in the countries working, and the work's been implemented worldwide. A uh, few accolades over the years, awards, things like that, always good to get. Uh, obviously, publications, things published, uh, exhibitions. Actually, my old pencil work, some of it's been retained by the RIBA, the Royal Institute of British Architects. I've always kind of liked that. And I've had stuff exhibited at the Royal Academy of Art. That was kind of fun as well. Um, so from that, that's essentially a very quick summary of my early days. And uh, we're going to hit the top 10, Laura. Yeah, I think we all learned a few things about Ian, didn't we? That was fun. <laughs> but a, a hundred clients across 14 countries is is just almost like mind boggling. It really is. And again, like you're in this place in your career right now, Ian, where you can look back and say, <coughs> big things I took away. And that's a really, that's a, that's a treasure time in your career. And take us through some of the top things. Let's just kind of get into talking about them so we can add some color commentary to them. Okay, okay, cool. Uh, the big thing for me is don't sacrifice what you love. Um, now, whether that's we, whether you want to be a CEO, you want to be a manager. In my case, I want to be design. I love designing. And you've got to be very careful that you don't sacrifice what you love uh, in your career. It's really easy to be promoted beyond what you like. Um, so, you know, from the very early days back in, in Scotland to London to the States, and this is kind of just a slew of stuff that shows, you know, I, I still design every day. Um, and I've had situations where I've been kind of pushed to, well, run this design group, do this, do that. I've always pulled it back to, I'm still designing every day. And to me, that's important, you know? So I think it's important that you figure out what you like doing and what's important to you and make sure that you, you pursue that path and don't let, you, don't let yourself get nudged off it. You know, I went from architecture to interiors to automotive retail to retail, but through all of it, for me, it was always about design. And even the move to the States was about that, it was about being able to focus on what I really want to do. And pursuing that passion, it sounds like. I mean, everyone always says, if you do what you love, it's not work. 
And I think it's easy to get enamored by jobs that are high in stature or like a client side job where you've got to see in front of it. And I think we've all seen some stories and I'd love to hear if you have as well from people like you who took jobs, you end up in a corporate position and you're no longer doing it. You think, gosh, is it worth it? Was the money worth it? Was the cachet worth it? You know, what about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you see it all the time. Um, and particularly when you're interviewing people to hire people, you know, a question we, we, we would always ask and I would always ask is, you know, do you, do you want to design? Do you still design? And, you know, particularly if I'm hiring somebody for a senior position, and if the answer is yes, I can be quite disappointed when you hire them and they don't really want to do it anymore. They don't have the passion anymore. They don't have the hunger anymore. I mean, design is in, in, many, in many, many ways, it's easy, but it's also kind of hard. You know, um, it's the fun part for me anyway. Um, so I think, again, you've just got to be honest with yourself. I think and ask the questions when you're taking a job, like how much hands-on work am I going to be doing versus how much kind of like corporate box checking am I doing? Go ahead, Catherine. I was going to say, I think for me, this, this passion shows up the most um, for you, Ian, in your work ethic um, to the point that you made about doing something love and you never work a day in your life. I've never seen somebody pull the hours that Ian pulls at this stage in their career. Um, so, I, I mean, I think he lives what he's saying here. <laughs> Absolutely. And you guys may not realize it, but I'm only 28. So just to let you know. You know. I didn't say it was easy. <laughs> I mean, I've it's never good. heard you complain, Ian, though. You'll pull an all nighter. You will. I've never once heard you complain of you, Catherine, ever. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> <night>. once. <laughs> Maybe once or twice. Yeah. <laughs> um, embrace the imposter. And, and we all suffer, you know, suffer from this, the imposter syndrome. Everybody in the world has it. And, you know, particularly with, I mean, even in the old days, so to speak, but even, you know, particularly now, projects can be quite complex. So you have a lot of partners coming in. Uh, and, you know, there was a project I did a few years back um, for transitions, and we literally had software engineers, we were writing the software from scratch, we were building the, um, the hardware from scratch for the project, I was the retail design guy on the project. And it can be quite intimidating. I mean, these are smart people. It's great. You're going to learn a lot, which is fantastic. And you've got to just embrace that imposter syndrome thing. And you know your stuff. You know, you're good at what you do. And just push forward. Just do it. And you're going to learn a ton when you're doing that from so many different people. Especially now. I mean, look at what's happening with retail. We're, we're literally creating the future today. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people that don't have answers, but if you have the historical knowledge and you've got that design mind and you work with people, I mean, we're figuring it out together, aren't we? And if we don't, then how can retailers count on us to help them kind of navigate through this? Mm -hmm. We're all learning together. If you don't go, someone's going to go instead, right? Yeah. And you said something there that's important is we are creating the future. It doesn't exist. So the, you really are putting your stuff on the line every day and pushing and, you know, not doing just the same old thing that's always been done. Um, and, you know, it, it, it means the imposter syndrome can, can almost kind of shut you down sometimes. And you've got to be careful not to let it do that. Just embrace it and move on. I think, Ian, you, uh, when we do our on-site visits with our clients, speaking of that, you are so good at leading the group through that. And I think part of it is that sort of, overcoming the fear. It's not that the fear isn't there, but um, really just pushing through it in an accelerated fashion. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you're gonna to touch on this a little bit more later, but I'd like to hear how, how you kind of approach that when we are on site. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, we do this thing where we go on site, it can be three days, a lot of the international stuff that might be a 10 day thing on site. And essentially you're designing a project in three days or two days, 10 days, wherever it might be. And you're compressing right down. And it takes, it takes a lot of courage because you literally are laying your skill set on the line. I mean, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have confidence in your abilities, it can, you know, it can fail terribly. And, you know, you've got to go in there really, you know, the first day, learn as much as you can. I mean, ideally have a lot of research up front that you read before you go. 
Um, and, and it's really getting the client on board. It's really making them part of the process so that they're committed to the project. They feel that the project is theirs. I mean, we're happiest and I'm happiest when we leave and the client's sitting there going, man, I came up with a great project there, a great design. You know, they have ownership of it. So, I mean, for me, that's one of the most powerful things about those on-site design sessions. They're scary, you know, and that imposter thing kind of kicks in because you really are laying yourself on the line. You know, by the time you leave, you're going to have that project designed and it's got to be good. Um, so I think that engaging the client, getting them really involved and also the client at multiple levels, um, it really helps a lot uh, in that and, uh, and helps build incredible relationships with the clients. Okay, sorry, I was waiting for Laura to say something. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I'm <fine reflecting>. <laughs> okay, have a few killer skills. Now, th those killer skills can be anything. You could be just really kick ass at Excel, you could be fantastic at presenting, you can be really good with technology. Uh, what I'm going to highlight here is the technology side. I mean, I got into this back in literally in 1990 with Wavefront and I, I told the story of that particular element and, and how we did it. And then the fact that there was that really, there was a really nice flight simulator that kind of got me touching the computer. And that for me has always been, as well as other skills, that's just been something that's always kind of been there. And you shouldn't be afraid of developing new skills and looking for skills that no one else has. I mean, particularly as the world changes so fast now and te technology changes so fast. Um, and at the base level, if it comes down to, you know, there's a downturn in the economy and there's three people and they're all really good and they all present well and they all have great design talent. If you've got one thing that a couple of the other people don't have, you you have a job still. They don't. So there's kind of a little bit of security comes from that as well. So think about that and kind of think about the future and what unique skill can I create? Something that's killer that's better than anybody else. Yeah, and and it make, can make you irreplaceable, can't it? Can it? And so often. So so let's talk about how you got into the Maya thing. You touched on this before. I mean, anybody that knows Ian knows he's the fastest Maya man on the planet. But I mean, the the beauty of being able to take a flat design and turn to something completely immersive, particularly for clients who have a hard time seeing the what if, and turning on that emotional resonance of oh my god, I gotta have that. Like that. How do you even replace that? Yeah. that you did that, like, I'm sure you probably had to do a lot of your own kind of teaching yourself of those skills. Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know what, sorry, go on. No, go ahead. So, you know, what actually happened is quite funny is, I mean, it's not really taking a design that's already there. I mean, this is designing in my, I mean, it's, it's direct. And, uh, and obviously from a client perspective, it's phenomenal. I mean, they're looking at what it's going to look like. I mean, the communication aspect of it is tremendous. Um, but what actually happened was I was learning slowly kind of, you know, I would spend an hour a night with this guy and he would show me a couple of commands. And, and then I had a project I had to design and it was a more interiors architecture beginning to get into automotive retail. And then he would show me, well, if you do this, you could build that. And, you know, I picked it up pretty quickly. I'd never, never touched a computer, but still kind of just took to it like a duck to water. But I got chicken pox. I was in London on business with uh, doing a bunch of work with Volkswagen. We were having a week's design session in London and I got chicken pox. When I was in London, I, I kind of didn't feel great. I was supposed to spend the weekend boozing up and having fun with friends. But instead I jumped on the plane early and came home. And the next day I woke up with chicken pox and I was quarantined for three weeks at home. So what I did was I had them bring the computer to my to my house in Houston, where I was living at the time. And I spent three weeks basically just hacking the software, calling the tech guy a hundred times a day. Well, how do I turn it on again? What do I do here? And uh, that kind of kicked me off. That gave me the initial skill set to, um, to be able to actually use it to do work. And I learned enough in that three weeks to do work like this, to really be able, be able to visualize, you know, what, what is the concept going to be? What will it look like? and show that to the clients. So it definitely takes time. I mean, it's not something, it's not something that you can kind of do nine to five. You gotta have a passion. You know, whatever it is that you're interested in, whatever it might be, there has to be a passion there because you're gonna end up spending a lot of hours at it to become a killer at it, for sure. But that's how you break through the career and you get your, your career path really yeah. sparked up, you know? 
yeah. I mean, it's the same in my case with design. I mean, you. I mean, I think there is a little bit of natural talent, but I can't remember who said the quote that you know it's 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 ninety percent perspiration and ten percent inspiration. There's work involved. I mean, there's hard work sitting down, Catherine, all the tests, you know, for days, just cranking through stuff and thinking and trying different things. Well, maybe if we approach it from this direction, you know. Um, and I think there's multiple sk skill sets that we all develop. I mean, I think presentation with clients, I'm, I'm pretty good at that. You know, there's multiple skills that we end up all developing over the years. You got to do the work. Yeah, yeah. This is a big one. Don't take yourself too seriously. And I'm going to say a bad word here, but basically don't be a dick. I mean, it's, it's, there are so many designers and, and senior creative people and strategists who have ego complexes. And I've always kind of felt that you need to really build a rapport with the client, really build a relationship with them. And, you know, for me, self-deprecation is a really important thing. That's how I do it. You know, I do it with humor. I do it by being self-deprecating. And I actually remember, um, this was quite a while back, um, there were a couple of people I was mentoring at a company I was at, and uh, I was sitting with one, with one of them, and there were two or three other people sitting around, and I was saying, look, it's really important, I think, that you be self-deprecating. You need to be self-deprecating, and that will really help you with the client. And she was looking at me like I was absolutely nuts. And everybody was laughing, and I had no idea what the hell I was saying. Oh, self-deprecating, self-deprecating, not self-deprecating. <laughs> so, uh, so that was quite funny. But um, yeah, essentially with this, um, it, it, it's a case of how do you create your style for how you work with a client? I happen to be, you know, I crack a lot of jokes. I'm a pretty laid back guy. I don't take myself too seriously at all. Um, and that really helps me build a relationship with the client on a one-to-one -one personal basis. Um, it also ties into kind of a power thing. A lot of people who take themselves too seriously are, well, I'm the boss and you're gonna do this. Um, you've got a mentor. I mean, you've got to train your replacement. Um, and obviously you want to have really good clay to work with. Catherine is an amazing example of just somebody who's just so naturally so good at pretty much everything. <laughs> um, and, you know, Catherine's job in about two years, maybe, is to slit my throat and take my job. That is literally what she is supposed to do. And she's been, see, she has the life. <laughs> but we all need to train our replacements. And that kind of ties into the whole don't take yourself too seriously. You know, we're all in this together. We're, we're doing a fun, we're doing a great fun, you know, work in a great fun career. So spread, spread the knowledge, spread the wealth, you know, and, and train people and bring them up and train your replacement. I, I would add on to that. One of my favorite mentors is a fellow named John Greeny. He heads up Northwestern's Integrated Marketing School and he ran the Budweiser account for 25 years. He did the whole, like the famous campaigns. And I once asked him, what was the one thing that you think is most important for client relationships? And he says, the ability to put people at ease. Mm -hmm. And he ran client services globally. He worked with some of the most talented people in the world. He said, nobody wants to work with somebody that makes them uncomfortable. And nobody wants to be around someone who has to be the most important person in the room all the time. Mm -hmm. It may be impressive, but it's not going to make you want to be with them. And this yeah. is a relationship business. And I know we're getting into this in a minute, but you got to have a relationship with people. It's hard to do if you're up here and they're down here. Yeah. Yeah, there was a good friend, uh, David Kotkin, you know, a marketing guy, and he and I were joined at the hip for years. And, uh, and he said it real simply, clients like doing work with people they like. Yes. It's that simple. So, you know, if you're likable and if you can build that relationship, I mean, it's, it's, it's a good thing. And people like working for people they like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you want those people to model your behavior and become good bosses too. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Uh, stay close to the client. This is kind of, maybe not this close, um, but stay close to the client. Um, it's really important, I think, and again, you know, if you're somebody who has passion, like I, I love design, I love what I do, and it's important that you're speaking to the client, that you're taking the brief from the client, that you're presenting your work. The, the, the last thing you want is to have a middle person you know, whether it's somebody in marketing or a manager or whatever it might be, and they're talking to the client and taking the brief and giving you their interpretation of the client, you know, of what the client said. And the same in the presentation, you know, if somebody else is presenting your work, they don't have the passion. I mean, frankly, they don't have kind of your heart that's in it. Um, 
so it's really important that you stay close to the client and you insist that you're the person that meets with the client and not just the top client. I mean, on, on most of the projects we do, we're talking to every level of the client body because um, somebody at the store level may have just, and in fact, in a lot of cases, many more insights of what the reality is rather than somebody who's up at the corporate level. Um, so yeah, staying close to the client is, is something that's very important. I think one of the things you've always done well that I witnessed back in the day, and I'm sure you see Catherine too, is you're so close to the client that you can almost think in advance of them, think ahead of mm -hmm. them. And when they brief you in, you get to know them so well that you can move so quickly because you know what they're looking for and you start, you know, you, re you learn to read them and anticipate them mm -hmm. and then give them work that makes them go, this person is so irreplaceable. Like I literally know that as long as Ian's with me, as long as this team's with me, I'm covered. Mm -hmm. That's the ultimate goal with clients. It really is. Yeah. And we have that. It, it really happens at a lot of different levels as well. Tony, who's been working with us for, you know, 10 years, uh, he's on the implementation side. He's literally the guy that goes out to the field. He leads the implementation teams and he can fix anything. This guy can do anything. And clients ask for him by name. They're like, I want Tony to be the guy that's leading the install on this next set of 100 stores, whatever it might be. So it's not just at the design level or the management or whatever. I mean, it's at every level that building a relationship with the client is really critical. Mm -hmm. I always say if, they, if it was easy, they wouldn't outsource it. Right, right, exactly. Oh, and I had a picture. I meant to go forward one slide. This is an example of a technique that I use. So this was a project I was doing in Turkey, three-year contract over there. It was a lot of fun. And uh, what what I did, what we did, I had a couple, couple of people with me, was we literally set up a table in the middle of the space. These are all the manager's offices around the, the photograph here, around the space. That's the managing director, the head guy there, and his office was there as well. And literally we were always there. They saw us working. We could ask questions easily. We became part of the family. They would bring us birthday cakes and stuff like that. I mean, it was fantastic. Um, and I also always work, this kind of gets back to what Catherine was saying about the work ethic. If they're coming in at seven in the morning, you go in at six, at 6.30 in the morning. If they're leaving at eight at night, you leave at nine. You know, always be there before the client, always leave after the client to really get across that work ethic and you're there with them and you're a team together working on the project. Might lead to long hours, but it, there's a lot of benefits that come from it. That is a great insight because optics matter and they mm -hmm. want to know that you care about their business. Yeah, yeah. A lot. Designer block, the horror that is designer block. Um, so you've done the research, you've got all the information that you need, you're sitting with a blank piece of paper and you've got to put a mark. You've got to start. And that can be so difficult. And I remember at, at university, you know, 300 years ago, a professor telling me that, you know, all of us students would sit around, we'd have a three month, a three week project. We'd spend two weeks hovering over a piece of paper with a pencil, terrified to make a mark. And his advice back then was just draw something, just start. You know, you have in your mind the knowledge, you know what you need to do, just begin. And, uh, you know, it's something that's very difficult to do. Um, so the, for me, the way to overcome it is very process oriented, you know, go through the process, get the information, figure out dwell times, the customer experience, what you're trying to do, and then start drawing. Even although it might be something for the first couple of days that gets thrown, it gets, for me, it gets the creative juices flowing. Where do you go for inspiration for this, Ian? Where do you look? I'm not somebody that, I mean, a lot of designers will put together lookbooks and, you know, look mood boards and things like that, where they pull other projects. That can be useful sometimes if a client doesn't really know what they want and you need to try and pin down at least an aesthetic, a general direction. But I've always been much more into go right down to the basics, you know, go right down to the data. What, what is the customer looking for? I mean, that's the most important thing, the customer. Um, and really pursue it from there. And then once, once you get all of that organized and all of that done, I've always been, a, I think it's the architect in me, I've always been a very process oriented guy. Once you get all of that sorted, the design kind of comes. I mean, in some ways it kind of designs itself, you know, the, the bones of it design themselves. Uh, and then from that, you can take it and run with it and, you know, really get the passion into it at that point. Is yeah, this this makes me think about the project that we were engaged on for a backup house um, piece of mm -hmm. retail, which mm -hmm. 
we know front of house back and forward and we know a little bit about back of house but it's so uh customer or client specific that type of work um that we both were kind of looking at each other going well where do we even begin and i'm wondering if you could share a little bit about how how you dove into that um and really that one i mean because it was back of house there wasn't that much from a design perspective i mean it, it was designed from a process design perspective um mm -hmm. and it was complex i mean if you remember i mean it, it we were cranking away long hours for several weeks on it it was very complex to figure out what the issues were what were the problems and that was a case where we really did need to talk to the store staff um i mean the the individual at the client who was dealing with this area he was super smart i mean this guy knew his stuff backwards but even with that by the time we went and talked to the store staff, we really began to understand some of the issues. And I think we came up with some really unique solutions, not just planning solutions, but also fixture solutions. Uh, they had a big issue where, uh, for OSHA reasons, and also a lot of the staff are, are short. Uh, I'm five foot four and a half, a magnificent five foot four and a half. <laughs> a lot of these people were shorter than I am, um, young women straight out of high school, um, and they didn't want them going over a certain height. So with that, we were like, well, how do we make that area up there? There were always short space back at the house. How do we make that accessible? And we came up with a way to solve that problem, to bring that space up there down. Um, and it's, I think it's really going to help them long term. But yeah, really on that one, Catherine, I think both you and I ended up relying back on what is the process? Let's go through it. We had a bit of imposter syndrome on that. We were a bit, you know, we know quite a bit about this, but not everything. And it really helped us kind of ground ourselves and give us a base to work from to move forward on the project. So there's two kind of takeaways you guys just added there. And one is that working with your teammates, commiserating with somebody can kind of sometimes unlock <laughs> ideas you didn't right. turn in there anyway. I've certainly seen that happen. But how many times have we just gone in field and talked to the associates, talked to the employees and gotten golden stuff and for some reason so few people do that but they're mm -hmm. looking at the problems and the opportunities every single day and they love getting their opinions asked yeah yeah i mean a really quick example of that was uh technos in turkey where the sales were terrible i mean they had foot traffic like you wouldn't believe turkey at that time was under mauled and they had they literally had people five deep on a saturday trying to buy a phone and it was taking them about an hour and 15 minutes to sell a phone and we couldn't understand why. I mean, there was no plan at that time in Turkey. It was just you you bought a phone, then you went somewhere else to get the plan. We managed to help change that in Turkey. Um, but um, then we really looked into it and we actually did a, bun a bunch of uh, motion studies using pedometers and people were walking, you know, 25 miles a day in a store. What, what, what's going on? What's happening? And what it was, was they had the warehousing elsewhere. So the actual sale would take about 15 minutes. It was easy peasy, no problem. Then it would take them an hour to walk to the warehouse, get the unit and bring the unit back because they wouldn't keep the actual live phones for sale, the merchandise on the floor. They only had dummy sales ones and uh, dummy display ones. And then we discovered that there was an executive whose uh, annual bonus was based on shrinkage, was based on loss, theft. And the shrinkage rate was like 0.00001%. So he got a huge bonus every year, but he was killing sales. So we managed to change that. We suggested to the managing director, change his bonus structure. You need to accept maybe 1% shrinkage, you know, 0.5%, whatever it might be. And then they brought the product on the floor and their actual closing rate went through the roof. I mean, and, you know, basket size, everything went through the roof. It was amazing. But that was, we wouldn't have known that if we hadn't done the pedometer study and talked to a bunch of the people on the floor. Turned a block into a breakthrough. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Death by a thousand cuts. Um, and we also kind of call this the duckies nibbling, people nibbling at what you're doing. Yeah. And this is the, the thing that drives all of us crazy the most. And, uh, you know, a project can disappear into this huge black hole from concept to implementation. A really good example of this, uh, one of the best I've seen, it's quite funny, if you go to YouTube, is the uh, basically the Apple packaging designed by Microsoft. It's about a two minute video, go watch it, you will die laughing. Um, 
And really with this, the, the, the only way I've kind of found to overcome it is the relationship with the client and really understand the issues, really understand what you're trying to solve. It's really important, I've always found, that you get the client out of what well, my opinion is. That's death to all of us. Um, and if you actually have the customer's voice, if you actually know the issues, if you know what strategically we're all trying to achieve, you can you can stop the death by a thousand cuts. You will end up with better work at the end of the day actually being implemented. And what I've found over the years, having a much better impact on the client's bottom line at the end of the day. And you don't eat, so what is it, Catherine? So many donuts at midday? Is that <laughs> Yes, Ian uh, asked me the other day how we how we typically deal with this, and I said I don't know. I just remember eating a lot of donuts and an emotional trance at the middle of the day. <laughs> exactly, but it really is understanding issues, really having a relationship with the client, and the voice of the customer, the voice of the customer, and the voice of the customer. You know. And there are times we hate to admit it, they're right, and there are times that oh, we're yeah. right. Oh yeah. Um, you know, there, there's there's even times that you just have to lean on getting out there and looking and seeing what the data tells you, because the data is a great neutralizer of opinions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And definitely, you know, I've had projects over the years where the client input has made the project better. I mean, there's no question about that. I mean, it's, it's you know, can be good, it can be bad. And I think the other big thing, and this is quite difficult for um, people who are beginning off in their career to, to pick up, is you've got to know the right battles to fight. You know, what to fight, what not to fight, what's important. There's always going to be compromise to some degree and which compromises are the right ones to make and which ones aren't the right ones to make. So. Amen. That one will kill you if you pick yeah. every battle as a battle. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've had great designers, you know, working with me and I've worked with them and they don't last long because they do fight every battle or they fight the wrong battles. And, uh, you know, I've seen really good people go to the wayside, you know, because of that. People with phenomenal talent um, who just didn't have that, that balance and that understanding that you can't go in hard on everything. You know, you've got to, it's a give and take. Yeah. And there's a little bit of learning how to read the body language of the people in the room as well, which takes a little bit of experience, but you can also learn it. And when you see that body language get to a certain point, just know to back it up for a little bit or give it a break. Yeah, yeah. The other thing that comes into it as well, personality comes into it. I mean, I, I would say I've had, I can really only think of two clients who just objectively disliked me over the years. And one of them worked for a very, very, very large C store company, the biggest in the world. And this was about 15, maybe 20 years ago. And he just didn't like me, just point blank, did not like my personality. We didn't click at all. And luckily, I was able to pull myself off the project and really off the front of the project and put another person in front. And I worked uh, more behind the scenes on that particular project. So knowing how to deal with that situation, I mean, you are going to get personality conflicts. And when that happens, stepping back, putting somebody else in, uh, it, you, you, again, it goes back to that whole not, not being a dick, <laughs> you know, understanding that there's something going on here that's not right. Step back, don't take the limelight and give somebody else that and let them handle it. Um, that's a great win, Ian. That's a super win because that happens to every single person. Oh, yeah. And you tend to take it personally. Why is this person? You just can't. You just can't take it personally. That's a great one to share. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, when to say no and can I? This is a really tough one. Uh, we all want, you know, work. We all like the fees. We all like to be able to eat. Um, and the answer is yes, you can say no. Um, if clients get abusive uh, in any way, and there's lots of different ways that clients can be abusive. Um, it can obviously be physical. It can be emotional. Um, it can be just not listening to anything you say, just not taking any of the advice. Um, it, it, you, you can. You can fire a client. I've done it in the past. Um, how you do it is very important. So you've got to be very careful with it. And no one to remove yourself from a team if you realize that there's something going on that, that you're not in control of too, because and there's, there's, a, there's a point where the wrong client can cost you so much money, but if you're mm -hmm. miserable working underneath something, there's not a whole lot that's worth that, particularly if you're putting yourself at risk or your career at risk 
because you could be accused of things by the wrong type of personality. You know, <laughs> I've seen legal risk come from this. I've seen people oh. actually set up a person or an agency to take a fall just in case. And those can get to be dangerous situations. You have to trust your instincts, don't you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, having, having that paper trail is really good. <laughs> so record your meetings, you know, afterwards and notes and emails and confirm stuff and whatnot. It's very good to have that. I had one particular client that asked, uh, this is when I had my own small company and it asked us to do a thing that cost us a lot of money. It was a physical prototype of an element. And then they decided, well, we, we don't want it. And we don't, we, we don't remember ordering that. It's like, well, no, I've got the email trail. You, and they just lied. And they just point blank lied. And that was it. I was done. You know, if a client just point blank lies like that, for me, it's, it's over. The trust is gone. Um, and, and then one other thing on this, and it's a tough one, but if you don't get paid, you know, you've got to get paid for the work that you do. And, you know, if, if you're on a three payment thing and the last payment never comes through, you know, I actually worked in an industry in a, a different category that I would normally do of s smaller businesses for a couple of years. And I had that issue quite a lot. And I just stopped doing work in that industry. I finished the contracts I had and the work I was doing and just never did any more. Um, Cause it wasn't just one client within that industry it was three or four over a couple of year period. So I was like, well, it's obviously kind of sketchy this industry, just, you know, I'm done. So you can do it. And yeah. by the way, you can think about it a lot, can't you, Karen? <laughs> can you, Catherine? You can think it a lot, but don't, not necessarily do it a lot. <laughs> Again, donuts at lunch. Donuts at lunch, exactly. Overcomes it. <laughs> I want to ask uh, one question that can go to both that one and this one as well. And how do you handle saying no and dealing with spec work when you're trying to win business and you don't really know the client yet? How do you handle that? It really depends on the kind of business you're doing. So, um, you know, like when I had my own firm, um, you know, I very deliberately didn't make the firm big. You know, I did not want to have a design firm with 25 people. Um, <clears throat> I want, I want a design. I don't want to be somebody who runs a design firm. I want to design. So I had a small firm and I would bring in a lot of freelance for large projects when I needed them and had a, had a group of people that I could pull from. And in that case, I would almost never give away design. Design was what was feeding me and everybody else who was doing work with me. And the one thing I would do is if it was an overseas client, I would give them two or three days on site. So to understand the problem. So um, if they paid all expenses, I would get myself out in Russia, wherever it might be, um, you know, the Middle East, Turkey, uh, Italy. And then I would give them a couple of days and to understand the issues and what they're trying to do. And then at, while I was there, I would write the proposal. Now, also what, what I'm doing obviously at the same time is I'm building relationships because we're all in a car and we're driving around and we're going for dinner and then we're having breakfast in the morning. And it gives you a couple of days to build a really good relationship with the client and for them to see how good you are at what you do. Again, it's kind of like designing on site. You got to be really sharp and on your feet. Um, when you're doing that. So when, I, when, when that was a situation where the design fee was everything, then I, I think just once maybe I did a little project, you know, that took about three days for free. Um, but I would never do, really do uh, free design. Um, if it's a situation where you're also manufacturing, well, then what comes into it is what's the opportunity, you know, from a manufacturing perspective. You know, if you're working with the biggest retailer in the world and they want you to design a certain thing and they're going to buy, you know, 10,000 of them, you might do some pre-design work at that point. But you got to be really careful about it because it's kind of a, a swirling bowl going down the toilet. And as more, you know, if more and more of us do, do free design work and give away what our skill set, you know, uh, for free, it's going to, it hurts the industry overall. So essentially, you've got to be very careful about spec work uh, and really try not to do it if you can. Right, and we've got, we're gonna open up here soon. So we'll run through that last couple and get to chatting. Okay, I mean, there's an old story that I really like and I've used this with clients when, when, when they've asked me to do stuff for free. Picasso was at a, a, a dinner table in a restaurant and a woman came up and I asked him to do a sketch. And, uh, and you gotta be careful. This can come across as being arrogant. You don't want to be arrogant. And he did a sketch and it took like 10 minutes and he gave it to her and she said, I'll pay you whatever you want. And he said, that'll be $10,000, the equivalent of. 
And she said, $10,000, but that just took you 10 minutes. And he said, no, 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 that's taken me a lifetime to do that. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have. We have a skill. We have, we have talent, and that needs to be paid for. And then the last one, this is really the most important one of all, is always live east of where you work. And if you always live east of where you work, you'll always have the sun behind you when you go to work and come home from work, and you won't have the sun in your eyes blinding you. So it's important to keep your eyesight, don't go blind, and always live east of where you work. You were doing finally, a webinar, you look like an angel, like right now. If there like we go. That's it. Let me get the <laughs> angel thing behind me. And then finally, uh, always have fun. Um, and always remember to get out there. This is Linda. We've been married for 14 years. She's lovely. She's sitting in the other room and hasn't uh, made a noise yet, thank goodness. And uh, always have fun with this as well. And travel as much as you can internationally. It broadens your mind. It opens you up to new experiences. And it's fun. We do a fun job. Okay. Yeah, it's it's a, you've you've got some really great ones in there, Ian, and we'd love to open this up to everybody. Okay, who's who's gonna go first? I saw Victoria on there. Victoria, get on there. Uh, <laughs> be the first one to go because we want to open this up and really get into a chat with everybody. Let's see, David. So who's who's got some experiences or stories they can relate to with this? Are there any observations or? questions or things to kind of dive deeper into i thought i thought the one about getting the client to invest in you spending a little time with them that's really pretty golden because you're not giving away your thinking but you're giving them a taste of your thinking we're building the relationship i wonder why we don't do that more sometimes as agencies too ian why do you think that is mm -hmm. Sorry, repeat the questions. I was like, why, why, why don't we get paid when we're with a big agency and there's a team involved to go and spend time with a client and kind of do that consulting hat? Let's really understand your problem, your business needs and get paid for it before we do any kind of proposal. That's a, a brilliant strategy. I think, I think there's an issue with our industry and it's, it's something that I think RDI can begin to address. Uh, it's not going to be easy, but... I don't think people know what retail design is and what retail designers do. Like an advertising agency, people kind of know that. They've all watched Mad Men and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, oh, they're crazy guys and you have to pay them a lot of money, but they do. I think retail design, um, because there are so many different people that claim they do retail design. I mean, anybody, an interior designer can claim it. An architect can claim it. Um, and it's a different skill set. You know, it's something that you have to develop over the years. So I think as an industry, the setting of a standard and some kind of real certification that you are a certified retail design firm or person or whatever it might be. Obviously, RGI does that to some extent. And I think Catherine, RGI might be talking about something like that. Um, I don't know about that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but what that does is it would elevate the profession to the point where, oh, you're getting a retail designer involved. Oh, well, you know, we know that we have to pay them because they're so good and they bring such a unique skill set that nobody else has. So for me, I think there has to be that elevation of the industry, you know, to something that not just anybody can, can say they do, you know. Yeah, because anymore, it's no longer about design, it's about solutions, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And there's so mm -hmm. many stakeholders to those solutions. You have to understand the customer, you can understand all the different in-store constituents are involved in something you have to understand you know so many departments are having to come together but the business problem you know mm. it's a lot harder it really is and now that accountability has become so much more important i, I think mm -hmm. that everyone's really looking for more help and it's it's almost a different um it's almost a different mindset i have to come in and solve this problem through design versus mm -hmm. design something that solves a problem right right <laughs> And I think as well, as, as a pure design, like if you're a designer, you need to go beyond just design. I mean, you need to think strategy. You need to think customer experience. You need to, you need to think, it gets back to that whole consequential solutions. You need to be thinking at a much deeper level because again, that's going to increase the value that you bring. And that ultimately, I mean, for us as people who are in this business, it's, it leads to more work. I mean, literally clients will keep on coming back to you. You become irreplaceable. Um, Boot Barn is a good example. You know, we've done several projects for Boot Barn over the year, over the years. 
Um, and some of them have been very special projects and they've come back to us because, well, man, you guys did so great on that one. And the, I mean, ultimately the numbers were good. They got the return on, on the investment for everything they did. So they've come back to us because we were thinking strategy, we were thinking positioning, we were thinking customer experience before we even got to design. Um, so I think bringing that uniqueness of providing the full solution, you know, really helps a lot. Do we have any questions here? David, also a Scotsman. <laughs> I totally agree about travel and understand the different cultures around the world. Yeah, you know, it's isn't it interesting how as an industry, we so often don't look at international cultures for some of both the inspiration and the answers. It's amazing. I met a CEO of an international ad agency once who said that you Americans are so bad about not just looking right under your noses, just talk to people across the pond and we'll give you some ideas on things you're just not thinking about. Mm -hmm. So, you know, having that open, opening your aperture and being curious and really going and looking for what answers might already exist. You've always done a lot of that. And part of yeah, that is immersing yourself. Well, when I first came to the States was actually 86, Linda and I came over for a three month vacation. We were actually supposed to come over for a year but just as I was leaving, Lord Astor of Heber, I'm, I'm name dropping now, offered me a job. And, um, and by the way, this is a good example of, he offered me a job running a design, I mean, running a development company. I mean, I was a mainstream architect back there and I was 27 at the time. I mean, I was a kid and Linda and I had planned this trip. Let's, you know, keep, keep the apartment we own, but sell the cars. Let's go to the States for a year, buy a Volkswagen microbus and drive around the country. And, as we were leaving Lord Astor, I'd done a couple of projects for him. He was like, oh, you need to come and run this development company for me. I was a young architect. I was like, sure, how much are you okay? How much money? Sure, I'll do. And we came over to the States just for three months. And I remember then immediately became clear that local news was your local city. National news was the state that you live in. And international news was the USA. We, you, you, back then you almost heard nothing about what happened in the rest of the world. Um, and to, to kind of fill in on that, don't kill the thing you love. I then went back to London after the three months with Linda and I did the job for a year and I hated it. I was so unhappy making big money. This was in the eighties. It was all, you know, I mean, it was yuppie stuff, blah, blah, blah company BMWs, all that. I mean, it was fantastic salary and et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the year, I resigned because, I mean, Linda was the one my wife pointed out to me, you're just miserable all the time. You hate your job. So I made the decision and I remember <clears throat> driving in in the BMW to the office and, you know, I resigned and handed the keys back and it, it was all done and good. And I was sitting on a bus going home on a cold winter's day in London, it was raining and I'm sitting on this, this bus thinking, what the heck have I just done? The BMW is gone, the big salary is gone. But then about two days later, I got a job with Heary, Heary London, and just kicked into some incredible projects. And within a couple of weeks, I was back, you know, back a happy camper. But, uh, but yeah, certainly different cultures, getting outside of the States and seeing as much as you can, I think really helps a lot. When it sounds like a lot of this is listening to your internal compass too, because had you, it takes courage to do that. Had mm. you not done that, you wouldn't have, you would not have created space for the right job to come in. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I think sometimes we live in a place of fear. How am I going to make the money? How am I going to get something right. new? Sometimes you just have to listen to your gut and say, it's, it's just time to jump so I can go find the right thing. And that's, it's, it's great to see and hear from people like you who have done that and come out the other side and realize it really is the right answer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So do we have any other questions or observations? It's really great stuff, Ian. I mean, it's kind of like, it, it's like listening to the equivalent of Oprah, but for the design <laughs> industry. <laughs> Well, as, you, as those great. who know me, as those who know me well know, I mean, every point there's a dozen stories and, uh, you know, well enjoyed over a beer or a glass of wine. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it, it, it's a fun industry. It's, it's, it's a fun place to work and we get to travel and we get to see a lot of different stuff. Um, I love my architectural background because I think the one, the one thing that that teaches you, I think other ones do as well, is how to think, how to learn. 
And every project, every new category you go into, every new project you go into, you're learning. You're having to learn a lot to really understand the issues and create something that's going to be unique. And I think it's really important that we do that, that we always strive for that right answer and something that's going to really have an impact for the client, but maybe have an impact on society and maybe make a change. I mean, I did a lot of work in the C-store industry to help change it to what it is today. I did a lot of work in automotive to help change it to what it is today. Um, and it's scary stuff when you're doing that, but it's really worthwhile and it's really, it's very rewarding to do it, so. Well, thank you for all the inspiration you provided to everybody. I mean that sincerely, Ian. Everybody's better for working with you and touching you. And the, the stuff you've done is, it should be inspiration to us all. And we really do thank you for sharing your time today. Hey, Victoria. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> There are several names from the past showing up here. I think you might be muted, Victoria. <laughs> yeah, it, it really is a wonderful industry and it's nothing better than getting seeing old faces like this and these fireside chats. So I, mm. I appreciate the opportunity to moderate today. Thank you. Yes, it's been fun. Thank you for okay. everybody who, who showed up. Um, if you guys wanna stay on and chat, we can stay on and chat. If you guys wanna drop off, that's that's fine too. Ian won't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. And I see May down there as well. Another name from the past. Hello, May. And obviously, Kyle and Ken and Paul and all the, the people that we know, but <laughs> Margo. Ian, Ian, actually, I don't know if you even know this, if you remember, but you gave me my first job. Is that me? Yeah, that's me. Oh, yes. Yeah, I do remember. I remember interviewing you. And then we work together. I don't know. I remember it very well. Hi. <laughs> so fun. I just randomly came across your post today on LinkedIn and I was like, oh, I have to, to attend that and say hello. That's great. I remember very deliberately paying you more than you asked for. He did. Yep. He did. <laughs> it was my very first job out of design school and I really didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> and I was so nervous. And yeah, often. Yeah more than what I'd asked for, which exactly. Yeah. I mean, your portfolio was phenomenal. And I was like, we got to make sure that this person comes and works here. So that, that's when you first out of school, an extra couple of thousand dollars makes a huge difference. Yeah. No, Ian, Ian, it was always even not just in that initial offer, but in the couple of years that we worked together, super supportive, super <laughs> supportive and a champion for everybody. So <laughs> I think that, that is a really important piece of your leadership skills, Ian, is uh, the support that you give to everyone who works for you hmm. okay. and the encouragement. I mean, you've, you've always pushed us to, I think, not only achieve more for ourselves, but to ask for what we deserve as well. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's quite funny. My wife is sitting in the other room, Linda. And she's sitting there muttering, I think, who are they talking about? What's this? <laughs> <laughs> and then there's Victoria. Victoria's an earlier version of you, Catherine. So Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yeah. we can. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. Gosh, so many stories you told that just came back to me again. <laughs> um, but, yeah. I I miss working with you guys. Yeah, so good to see you. Wow. Yeah. By the way, your family looks amazing. The pictures on, on Facebook. I mean, the lifestyle you guys have is phenomenal. Well, it's great with Photoshop, what you can do. You know, you make <laughs> life look amazing on social media. No, yeah, it's, it's, we love living in Colorado. So, mm -hmm. lots to do here. But I will say some of the pictures you had of you looking all classy for your uh, presentation, but I never really saw you. <laughs> Look at how classy like that. For that was pretty classy. That was uh, maybe just three years after I moved to the States when I was in Houston with CRSS. And I just won my first big AIA award. And I went and rented a tux. And you know me, I'm not a tux kind of guy. You know, I'm a t-shirt kind of guy. But I actually went and rented the tux and the bow tie and did the whole thing. And uh, so photographs had to be taken, embarrassing photographs. Ian, do you want to talk about your philosophy of having one outfit? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, essentially, uh, what my outfit now, it's changed over the years, is uh, not shorts that I'm wearing right now between all of us, um, but uh, I have a pair of white shorts on. 
Um, but uh, jeans, black jeans, black shirt, Oxford cotton, black shirt, sleeves up, and uh, scarves. I have about 25 different scarves uh, that I wear. And I have literally 15 of these shirts. I've got about 10 pairs of the same jeans, partially because if I find something that fits me, I buy 10 of them. I'm a bit Winnie the Pooh shape, if you guys remember. Um, and I've got three pairs of the same shoes. And the only thing I really change is the scarf. And you just don't have to think about getting dressed in the morning. You just put the same thing on, make sure it's clean, and a different scarf each day. So And save all that brain power for your design exactly. work, right? Exactly. You got it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Linda's daughter, coming to stop her phone. <laughs> my daughter was really inspired by your um, talk, by the way. Oh, excellent. Thank you. Little you should be inspired by your mother. Your mother was amazing. Yes, <laughs> indeed. Indeed. <laughs> Any other questions? Any other queries? I, I just wanted to make one comment. I've known Ian quite a long time. And when you were talking about the auto um, work, I remember once at a conversation here in New York with a bunch of designers. And one of them said, you know, there was this BMW showroom that I've always wanted to know who did it because it was the best car showroom I've ever done. And it was Ian's and it was 10 years old at that point. <laughs> so when he says he changed the look of things, believe him. <laughs> legendary you didn't show it tonight but it was the legendary project that yeah that's the thing i mean when you've done this, this much work i mean you just can't show you know i mean it's i mean that was one percent of the work i've done i mean it's, no, it's tiny. But, but it was you know it's this guy saying he remembered it 10 years later it was his <laughs> epitome of integrated multidisciplinary environment brand environments or whatever we call it now mm. It's great. Yeah, I can tell you the bribe money for all these nice comments is going to cost me a fortune. It's, uh, I did that one time, by the way, with uh, the client in Turkey. Um, great guys, really got along with them well. I mean, really good clients. I mean, tough negotiators, but once you had a deal, you had a deal and very open to new ideas. And I, yeah, I kind of do this thing where, you know, if somebody says something nice when they introduce me on stage, I'll take a couple of bucks out and pretend to give them the money and it gets the audience kind of laughing and, and kind of breaks the ice uh, when you're doing it. And I went out and I grabbed a Turkish uh, note from my pocket and it was the equivalent of a hundred bucks. So I pulled out this hundred bucks and handed it to him and everybody responded and warmly and it broke the ice and he took it. And then afterwards I said to him, oh, by the way, can I have a hundred bucks back? And he was like, no, you gave me the hundred bucks. I've got a hundred bucks. I'm happy. You know, I'll buy you a beer, but you ain't getting a hundred bucks back. <laughs> I guess that's why I just get donuts now. That's yeah. it. That's why you just get donuts. Okay. No more hundred bucks. <laughs> We've been good recently, though. We haven't had donuts. I mean, even before COVID, we were, we'd kind of stopped the donuts, you know. Well, we sure are looking forward to getting everybody back together in person and really appreciate mm. everybody who joined from afar today. It was yeah. really special. And great seeing you guys. May. Fun to see you. Victoria. Yeah. Cool. Everybody. Thanks, everyone. Okay, take care. Bye. Okay. Bye. Everybody have a good night. Bye-bye.